The LA Clippers completed their back-to-back this weekend and took a split. A win at Sacramento led by Paul George's 40-point masterclass, followed by an abysmal performance at home in the home opener against the Phoenix Suns. I'm going to be talking about both games starting with the loss to the Suns on today's Locked On Clippers. Yes, sir. You are locking in with the Clips. Thank you for making Locked On Clippers the first listen of your day, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Make sure to go make your daily fantasy entries and based on player projections, it is not gambling. That is Prize Picks. So, as always, I'm your host, Darian Viziri, starting my 18th year as a member of Clipper Nation. I have my own YouTube channel known as Dime Dropper where I go live after LA sporting events and will be posting the vlog from the Suns game that I attended on Sunday night. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dime Dropper Pod and of course subscribe to Dime Dropper Podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. But of course, subscribe to Locked On Clippers as well. We are very close to reaching 1,000 subscribers and finally getting monetized. Answer today's pin question, and that question is, should the Clippers make a change to the starting lineup before Kawhi Leonard is reinserted into the starting lineup? So, obviously, Kawhi Leonard is going to be returning into the starting lineup. We don't know when that's going to be, but until then, should the Clippers make a change? Because against this Phoenix Suns team, a lot of flaws were exposed. And I'm going to start with that game right now, talk about the Kings in segment two, and then put it all together in the final segment and talk about the good and the bad. So the Clippers against the Suns, you know, when I looked at the schedule in previous episodes and talked about the first 10 games, I said the Phoenix Suns game was going to be likely the one that the Clippers did not win, and they absolutely didn't win, and they weren't even close to winning. Starting lineup was the same. Of course, Kawhi Leonard and John Wall back from the game against Sacramento load managing, and they both came off the bench. But the starting lineup for the Clippers really got them off to a terrible start. They were down 9-0, to zero, if I'm not mistaken. At least 9-0. to zero. It may have been 11-0, but it was 9-0. to zero. Clippers took a quick timeout when it was 7 nothing, But they just dug themselves a hole. And a big reason is you got to give credit to the Phoenix Suns. DeAndre Ayton in drop coverage was amazing. You know, I always talk about Ivica Zubac's better in drop coverage on defense than people give him credit for, but DeAndre Ayton is one of the best in the league, in my opinion. He does a really good job of showing out on the ball handler and also staying attached to the roller and playing both guys at once, but it's also easier when you have an on-ball defender like Mikael Bridges getting over those screens, and one thing about the Phoenix Suns is they had Mikael Bridges and Cam Johnson, two solid wings getting over those screens. The Clippers had Paul George and Marcus Morris. But they're a little undersized in the backcourt, Reggie Jackson and Norman Powell. And the guy that ended up throwing the first punch to the Clippers was Devin Booker. And he would not be stopped all night long. He was the reason why the Suns were getting such better looks than the Clippers because he was breaking guys down off the dribble. And that was one thing that the Clippers struggled with yet again. We saw a lot of switching from the Suns, not as much with Aiton. Aiton wasn't really getting switched onto the centers. I'm sorry, onto the guards. Same with the Vitsa Zubats. But everybody else was switching a lot. And they were taking away dribble penetration very well. And that's on the Clippers players to create. You know, Reggie Jackson and Norman Powell. Norman Powell actually started out pretty well in this game. He had a couple of buckets. But Reggie Jackson, he didn't give the Clippers anything. Not just in the first quarter, but the entire game. Didn't give the Clippers anything. And when I rewatched the game after I got home, it looked like his body language was just like he didn't care. And obviously, I know Reggie cares a lot. People are saying he has a groin injury. And if that's the case, sit him. Because right now, he played well against Sacramento. I'll talk about that in the second segment. But he's played two bad games out of three so far. And Reggie Jackson, last season, had some games where, you know, he's a hit-or-miss player. He's a role player. Some games he's going to be incredible, do way more than you expect. And then some games he's going to be really, really poor. And when he started last season for the Clippers all season, you know, they were a 42-win team. 
But part of that is because, you know, Reggie Jackson, for 42 win expectations, Reggie Jackson starting is not a big deal. Like, that, that's, that's what he is. And you might be thinking, he started on the Clippers when they went to the conference finals. You're absolutely right. And maybe that's an exaggeration I'm making right now that he should go to the bench that, um, because Kawhi Leonard hasn't started yet. But Reggie Jackson's hit or miss starts are a little problematic at times, especially when he's kind of supposed to be that secondary creator outside of Paul George in the starting lineup right now. Norman Powell, he hasn't shown too much as a creator, and maybe he should stick to being a more of a catch-and-shoot guy. When guys run him off the three-point line, he can drive to the basket. But he also should be able to score one-on-one better than he's showing. You know, he had a couple better moments in the Suns game, but... He still needs to be doing more. I I called him the third best player on the Clippers, and it's looking like that's not even going to be close of a prediction. My predictions, some of the predictions I made before the season are looking really trash right now. So, hey, man, I'm not a future teller. I I analyze, this is where my, I think I'm better at this, analyzing the games than the actual, you know, predictions. Predictions are very random. But the point is, the Clippers dug themselves a hole. And even though after the timeout, the initial timeout, they kind of, brought it back a little bit, hit a couple of shots. Marcus Morris Sr., again, was just fantastic. Another great performance from him. That's one guy you can say is not doing anything wrong. I mean, he did get broken down off the dribble a couple of times, but he was overall great offensively, got a couple of rebounds, and just looked so good to start the season. Marcus Morris had 22 points and five rebounds, and only one turnover in this game. He was 10 for 14 from the field and 2 for 5 from 3. And the degree of difficulty on his shots were not easy at all. So Marcus Morris, you are the man so far this season. And my, again, another prediction that was terrible. Me saying Marcus Morris may, uh, should probably get traded. His presence on the team feels redundant. Absolutely not. The Clippers need him desperately right now. But Norman Powell had two wide open right corner threes that didn't fall in the first quarter. Reggie Jackson had an open 15, 16 footer that he always makes with DeAndre Jordan, DeAndre Jordan, DeAndre Ayton dropping in drop coverage and didn't make it. And Paul George started out cold yet again. And those cold starts, it really dug the Clippers into a hole. And the reason why I'm harping on that first quarter so much is because that's really, to me, one of the main reasons why the Clippers lost. They just could not recover from the early deficit. And John Wall came into the game for Reggie Jackson and got the place going. You know, the most energy in the building was when John Wall came into the game. He was pushing the pace. He was actually getting by guys and getting to the basket. And it was getting the Clippers back in it a little bit. As for Paul George and how he started the game, his first possession, I thought it was a bad call on the offensive foul. Mikael Bridges was had his hands all over Paul George. And that's one thing I cannot stand in the NBA when they make this rule about hand checking is not really a thing anymore and the contact on the perimeter is limited and they pick and choose when they want to enforce that. And when guys have their hands all over an offensive player and an offensive player gives them a little shove to great separation and that's an offensive foul on the offense, I'm all for the defense getting benefits. I think the offense gets way too much leeway in today's game, but that's just whack. That's just whack because you give certain players all these landing space fouls and certain things, but when a guy has his hands all over a player and Paul George gives him a little shove, it's an offensive foul. But after that, Paul missed a couple of jumpers and, again, didn't get any easy looks. And you got to credit the Suns' defense for that a little bit as well, but he didn't get any easy looks to get him going, and he never really fully got going, at least not in the first half. But John Wall did a good, th- good, a good job of, of kind of reviving – some life into the building because it had been sucked out by Devin Booker. I mean, he was just getting whatever he wanted. He was being guarded by Paul George in the first quarter mainly, and he was just hitting really tough shots. Like, there were some shots that Paul George couldn't do anything about, and that's that's just how good Devin Booker is, and I think we often forget because Chris Paul's on the team and because they choked in Game 7, but Devin Booker is a really, really great player, and he's one of the best in the league, and he has been for the last three seasons, four seasons to be honest, this being the fourth. Ever since the Monty Williams has taken over, he has really played winning basketball. If your criticism of him was that he didn't produce wins before Monty Williams, you cannot say that after Monty Williams. He's locked in more on defense, and his defensive effort is much better on a night-to-night basis. But Kawhi Leonard, by the way, the first quarter, 33-18 to in favor of the Suns. And the most appalling thing to me about it all was when 
the Clippers went to their bench. Because going into the game, you thought, okay, the Suns' starting lineup is better than the Clippers without Kawhi. That's just a fact. But when you go to the bench, the Suns lost JaVale McGee. The Suns lost Jay Crowder. So now Cameron Johnson is starting. The Clippers' bench should be much better than the Suns. That's where, especially with Kawhi Leonard coming off of it, that's where the Clippers should have an advantage, right? Did not go as planned against the Suns. Did not go as planned on Sunday. And a big reason was the Clippers went small, and again, we saw the flaws in the small ball lineup. All offseason, small this, small that. I remember when Asher came on the podcast, he said the Clippers don't even need one center. That may have been worse than any of my predictions thus far. Even though he was spot on about Musa, that could have been the worst take we had so far because the Clippers were getting bullied by Jock Lawndale. Is that even his name? Jock Landale? He was killing the Clippers. He was looking like Nikola Jokic out there, getting offensive rebounds, scoring on the interior. So the Clippers obviously went undersized defensively and weren't able to rebound, and that was the biggest reason they lost to the Suns in the conference finals. They did not rebound. Say whatever you want about Kawhi Leonard not playing. No rebounds, no rings. It came back to bite the Clippers in the conference finals big time. But in this game, on one end, right, the advantage of the small ball is to switch everything, right? Okay, they can switch everything, but some guys weren't able to contain Landale on the glass. And then an even bigger issue was offensively. You go small because you want to spread the other team out, but what's the point of having shooters spread out when the guy on the ball is not getting by his initial defender and forcing guys to collapse? I think one emphasis that Monty Williams had for his team on Sunday night was stay home on the shooters. Don't let them get open threes. Make their players go one-on-one because I think if I'm a coach right now in the NBA, I would switch everything on the Clippers and make their players go one-on-one because Reggie Jackson wanted no part of going one-on-one last night. He went one-on-one one time, and I think it was against Landale, I'm pretty sure, and he missed with a left-handed layup in the second half. Norman Powell is having trouble getting to the basket without pushing off or you know just getting clean looks at the rim, and Paul George was aggressive against Sacramento and against the Lakers and the Suns, not so much. Kawhi Leonard, funny enough, when he came into the game in the second quarter... Got an and one right away. And the one thing you can say about Kawhi, even though he was two for six in this game, was that he actually got to the foul line. And it wasn't off just burst. It was kind of similar to how LeBron's doing it right now. Just his shoulder, just getting guys on his hip and going into the shoulder and making them have to do something because his shoulder's so strong, he's pushing you back two feet. He got to the line seven times, Kawhi, and made all seven of them. But a huge issue was that small ball lineup, Robert Covington, Nico Batum, those guys are not creators. So it's you're putting all the onus on John Wall to get by somebody on the other team. And he was doing that, but besides him, nobody was. And when Jock Landale is able to switch one to five and stay in front of guys, then that's a terrible thing. That means that the Clippers are not taking any advantage of this small ball lineup at all. And that means that Musa Diabate, who was in street clothes, which is disappointing, should be playing. Because he showed enough in the preseason where you could put him in for a couple minutes. He's never going to learn if you don't give him a chance. Give him a chance. He not only had good tenacity and rebounding and all that other stuff you expect from a big man, but he's his foot speed. He was able to actually switch one to five. So that's why I think he should definitely get some burn in a situation like that. Zubats was on the bench entirely too long, even though he didn't have a great game himself. He had 21 minutes. He only played 21 minutes, I should say. But coming up, I'm going to keep talking about the game and then slowly transition into the Kings game. But there's a little more to get into with this Suns game. Going to be talking about all of that and the Clippers' quote-unquote fake comeback coming up. On Wednesday, I'm taking Nikola Jokic to have a triple-double against the struggling Lakers. And I'm going to be doing that on Prize Picks. It's a daily fantasy site, not a gambling site. And you make entries on Prize Picks. How does it work? You just pick two to five players and predict if they will score more or less than the Prize Picks projection. Or get more rebounds than the Prize Picks projection. Or more assists than the Prize Picks projection. You can win up to 10 times your money on any entry. And you're not competing against anybody. It's just you versus the projections available. And Prize Picks offers projections on any sport that you watch. It doesn't have to be NBA. It could be NFL. It could be MLB. It could be NHL. It could be the PGA. It could be college football. College basketball is on the horizon. So go play some entries 
on that. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. It doesn't take long. And it's safe and fast withdrawals. It's currently operational in over 30 states and Canada. Just download the Prize Picks app or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. If you deposit $100, Prize Picks will give you $100. If you deposit $50, Prize Picks will give you $50. Don't forget to enter the promo code locked on to sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. That's locked on in all caps. Okay, let's continue. So the second quarter for the Clippers, you know, again, I say it, the small ball lineup just did not work very well. And I think Ty Lu, I hate criticizing coaches. I really do. But in this game, I think Ty Lu didn't have a great one. I think he went entirely too long with the small ball unit that quite frankly wasn't doing much positive out there in the first half. And even though Ivica Zubats just wasn't as impactful as the first couple of games, he only had two points. He missed a really easy layup that he usually makes in the first quarter with his left hand. And DeAndre Ayton just gave him a tough time. He just couldn't get going, but I still think he should have played more because teams can't just switch everything on the Clippers when Ivica Zubats is in because he'll actually be a presence down low. However, when Ivica Zubats is in, probably DeAndre Ayton would have been in as well. And one look the Clippers went to because they couldn't contain uh, Devin Booker and, and at times Cameron Payne on the dribble penetration. And that's one thing the Suns were looking for. Cameron Payne taking certain guys like Robert Covington and Marcus Morris Sr. off the dribble because he's still really fast and can make your defense collapse. And that's one thing he did pretty well. And the Suns, despite only shooting 36% from three, 15 for 42, they got some higher quality looks than the Clippers. The Clippers only shot nine for 32. So another game or the Clippers did not shoot well from deep, just like the Laker game. 9 for 32, you can argue they needed to get more attempts up compared to the Suns, who made six more threes, which eventually accounted for 18 more points, and they won the game by 17, 112 to 95. But they weren't getting good looks, the Clippers, and that's because they weren't breaking guys down off the bounce. You know, when Kawhi Leonard came in in the second half, and he played more in the second half, you saw them double teaming the mid post at times, and that was creating some open looks. That's good that Kawhi Leonard can draw a double team in the mid post. But who just went off in the mid post on Saturday? That was Paul George. And you didn't see him catch the ball there at all, really, against the Suns. He went back to doing what he was doing against the Lakers. And Mikhail Bridges just did an amazing job getting over those screens. And various guys just did a good job defending Paul George. There were even some times in transition where he had Chris Paul in front of him. And I don't know why the Clippers don't attack Chris Paul enough on defense. You know, he is a solid defender. He's got really good hands still. But make him work. You know, we saw him get exploited in the playoffs the last two years in various ways deep into the playoffs on the defensive end. you got to make him work. Try to get him in foul trouble. You know, Devin Booker, he had one foul he picked up on an offensive foul, and the Clippers didn't go at him on defense to try to get him a second foul. And I think at times teams just don't remember or it's not as part of the strategy anymore to go at guys with fouls to get them in foul trouble. I just don't, I don't understand it sometimes. But... Second quarter wasn't as bad for the Clippers. However, they went to the break down by 20, 41 to 61. And I, I you know, I, it's funny, funny enough, I still thought the Clippers would come back just because I have so much confidence in their comeback ability. You know, the Clippers are the comeback kings. You know they're going to come back. They made a little push. They cut it down to 10, and it actually was with the small ball lineup. What's funny is they got DeAndre Ayton in foul trouble with four fouls early-ish in that third quarter, and then Jack or Jock Landale. I keep thinking it's Jock Land. I keep thinking it's Jack Londale, and then the Jock Landale kind of confuses me sometimes. But when Landale came back into the game, the Clippers went back to that small ball with Rocco. And I got to say this about Rocco. I've called it out so many times. But the threes that he takes, there's no secret why he went one of five from the field and one for four from three. He's not taking good threes. The only one he made was open, like a good look. Some of the ones he was taking were just those catches the ball, acts like there's no defender in front of him, and throws it up there. And he airballed one. It's like, dude, it's not your fault that you're missing those shots. You shouldn't be taking those shots because they're extremely difficult. The only player on the Clippers that should be taking those kind of shots are Paul George, Reggie Jackson at times with Reggie, but Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, and 
Marcus Morris. And Marcus Morris was the main reason the Clippers were getting back into it in that third quarter. He was hitting really tough shots, contested mid-ranges, threes. And one thing I've been really encouraged about with Senior this season is he's really trying to take guys off the dribble. You know, even if he can't get all the way because he's not the quickest guy in the world, he can at least get them off balance where he can stop and turn and he's closer to the basket now where he can shoot a, a shot from closer 10 feet in, 8 feet in. He was incredible, incredible. And the one thing also about Norman Powell and Rocco and Nico and all these guys, Luke Kennard, who, by the way, the Suns completely shut down because they switched every single off-ball screen with Kennard, which was letting him not get even an inch. So credit to the Suns for that. So the moral of the story is when teams are going to switch everything on the Clippers, they need their creators to penetrate and make things happen. And John Wall was really one of the only ones that made that happen in the game. You know, the Clippers cut it down at 10, 82, 72, but they could not get it within single digits, and you got to give the Suns credit for that. A big reason was rebounding. You know, at the end, the rebounding battle wasn't too far. It was 49-43 in favor of the Suns, but offensive rebounds, 13 to the Suns for, to 19 to the Clippers. And, you know, when the Clippers don't shoot well from three, Paul George was four for 11. You know, he did start hitting more in the third quarter, but he only had 16 points, shot four for 11, and two for six from deep. And mind you, he did try to go to the basket a little more in that third quarter, and there was one play when the, it was around that 10-point, when it was a 10-point game. He goes to the basket and looked like he got hammered. No call. Devin Booker comes back the other way and scores. And then Paul George, obviously having just gone to the basket, was like, I'm going to take a three. Got a decent look and barely drew iron. I think it may have airballed. So that was really tough. You know, Paul George, when Paul George doesn't play well, and Kawhi Leonard is on a minutes restriction. And by the way, Kawhi started the third quarter, as did John Wall. But, and that was the only quarter the Clippers won. They won the third quarter 31-25, but they just didn't make enough big plays or get enough string of stops to really get the crowd going. And that's one thing you got to give Monty Williams. He took really good timeouts, and the Clippers just did not inch close to the point where it really made the Suns nervous and the Suns role players you know Landry Shamit was two for five from three former Clipper Landry Shamit Cameron Johnson who the Clippers got in foul trouble which was good very good because in his minutes he was fantastic he had 11 points five boards didn't turn the ball over he was four for six from the field and three for four from three two of those came in the first quarter and were not easy shots at all you also saw the Clippers go zone a little bit, 2-3, and I didn't like the look at all. It got a couple of stops, but it also allowed a couple of open threes, and the main issue with zone for me at any level, whether it's youth level or, or NBA level, is rebounding. Because you're not guarding a guy, it's very easy for you to ball watch and guys to creep into the gaps and get offensive rebounds. And when rebounding was a problem for the Clippers, for them to go zone, I just didn't like that move from Ty Lue uh, one bit, honestly. And I think it just didn't do much good. And the Suns were just the better team in every way. The Clippers, you know, they tried a little bit in the fourth quarter, but to no avail. To me, Marcus Morris Sr., Kawhi Leonard, who I thought was actually pretty solid, even though he's still getting his legs underneath him with the three ball. He was 0 for 2 from 3. He's looking more encouraging. And he even had a really nice block on Mikhail Bridges. Got a, six rebounds, too. It just shows that Kawhi Leonard is still the Clippers' best player. It's just a matter of time before he can be allowed to play because what's happening right now is, and this is why I wouldn't overreact, Kawhi Leonard's going to start for your Clippers. Kawhi Leonard will be starting. Right now, it's like they're in a, in a weird way of implementing these guys, John Wall, Kawhi Leonard, back from these injuries and having these temporary starting lineups. And it's not that the guys haven't played together. It's that they're figuring out how to play together in the same lineups, figuring out a pattern. And you're going to need a little bit more time than three games to let patterns develop. However, I'm not so sure how sold I am on Reggie Jackson and Norman Powell starting together. I know Norman Powell's not going to start when Kawhi comes back. It'll be either Reggie or John Ball, Paul George at the two, which is going to be awesome. Kawhi Leonard, Marcus Morris Sr., who's really solidified that spot. And then if it's a Zubats. But until Kawhi Leonard comes back, I would consider starting John Wall because the Clippers desperately need more creation off the bounce. And I just think that the, when Reggie Jackson's cold, those slow starts are not inevitable, but it could very well be a thing because Norman Powell has not shown to be reliable so far this season. He had eight points on four for nine shooting in the game. He had some better defensive moments, but he turned the ball over three times and overall did not do enough, in my opinion. And when Ivica Zubats and Reggie Jackson are two starters combining for two points, 
that's never going to be a good night, and especially when your best player, which is right now Paul should be Paul George, only scored 16. Devin Booker being the best player on the court with 35 points on 13 for 21 shooting and 5 for 9 from deep is the main reason the Suns won the game. You know, all that stuff I'm saying, the small ball, this and that. Devin Booker commanded the game. He was unstoppable. Clippers couldn't do anything about him, and he was taking advantage of the weaker matchups, whether it be Robert Covington or Marcus Morris, on switches and getting by him. So the Suns beat the Clippers 112-95. to It's a work in progress, folks. It's not going to happen all at once. But the Clippers have two games against the Oklahoma City Thunder coming up in Oklahoma City. Two great opportunities to get wins against a weaker team and slowly start building some patterns. But coming up, I'm going to be talking very briefly, very briefly, about the Sacramento Kings game. And remember, this is a a five-day-a-week podcast, so I can still go in-depth about anything I didn't cover on tomorrow's episode as well. So Sacramento game, I'll probably talk about that even more on Tuesday because... Why not? But going to be getting into that coming up. The Utah Jazz are off to an insanely hot start to the season, surprising everybody. And in their next game against the Houston Rockets on Monday, they are minus two. So why not place your bet on the Utah Jazz right now? Lowry Markkinen playing some great basketball. And to do that and place your bets, you got to go to betonline.net. It's your number one source for your betting football, basketball, and any sport information find all the latest player developments team matchups news podcasts and in-depth analysis on every game and as always bet online remains your continued source for all your sports wagering information with live betting and up to the minute scores for every sport you could think of mlb playoffs are drawing to a close so make sure you place your bets on that and then of course the world cup is less than a month away can you believe it make sure you place your bets on that head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more bet online where the game starts All right, to close it out, I'll be briefly talking about the Kings game. Clippers and Kings, obviously they had no Kawhi Leonard, no John Wall, and Paul George just did what Paul George is supposed to do. Not necessarily score 40 points, but he was the best player on the court. And as great as De'Aaron Fox was, Paul George was getting the ball way more in the mid post, and they could not guard him. And when he catches the ball in the mid post, I like it so much more because... Not only can he just rise up over the top without even taking a dribble, whether when he takes one or two dribbles, he can get in the paint just like that. And then he can elevate and rise up. Whereas when he starts at the three-point line, top of the key, running pick and roll, that's a little bit less, it's a little bit more awkward for him, even though it's still good. But when he isolates at the top on a smaller defender, that's giving the defender the advantage. Not necessarily the the advantage, but it gives him more of a chance to guard because you're playing at floor level. Whereas when you catch it in the mid post, whether you're turning and facing or po- backing down on him, Paul George has that size advantage. And he was absolutely cooking the Sacramento Kings in the mid post. And there were a couple times where he drew double teams the same way you saw Kawhi Leonard draw double teams against the Suns in the second half. And it seemed like he had a better he did a better job making passes out of that double from that area. And Vince Zubats had a nice dunk from Paul George in that game as well when he was getting doubled in the mid post. And Vince Zubats was spectacular against the Sacramento Kings. He rebounded. He defended well. He had 10 points, 8 rebounds. He was just awesome. Again, though, Norman Powell had a really tough game against the Kings. 1 for 10 from the field. So he just needs to be better. There's no other thing to say about it. Reggie Jackson, though, even though I just gave him a hard time, he had a good game against the Kings. He was 4-for-5 from the field, took some good shots, wasn't forcing anything, was 3-for-3 from deep, had a nice move to take Rashawn Holmes off the dribble in the fourth quarter, and was just, he did his job. And one thing I'll say about the Clippers in that Sacramento game was, it was a very neck-and-neck game. You know, the whole way, it was a game of not many runs, to be honest. But the third quarter, each Quarter the clip each third quarter this season in the first three games the Clippers have won so that's one good sign they won the third quarter 34 to 25 against the Kings and that ultimately ended up giving them a little lead that gave them the win because the Kings did make a little run in, in the end but the Clippers did a good job of sustaining that and that was mainly due to Paul George but a one con in my opinion to the Clippers depth right now is that Terrence Mann's really not getting many minutes he played 15 minutes against the Sacramento Kings and then came in in garbage time against the Suns and was actually making jumpers, funny enough. But 
I know Luke Kennard is a better offensive player, way better shooter. I know Robert Covington and Nico Batum are going to be mainstays in the Clipper team, and they played a lot better against Sacramento, too. They combined for five for six shooting. Nico made every single shot he took. He had seven points, five rebounds, three assists, two steals, and a block. So Nico was really good against the Kings. Mediocre against the Suns. Robert Covington was good against the Kings. Had a nice steal to put the Clippers up 10. Had back-to-back buckets, actually, to put the Clippers up 10 in the fourth quarter against the Kings. Poor against the Suns. But Terrence Mann is, in my opinion, the Clippers' best point-of-attack defender, at least when Kawhi... Kawhi is not going to be asked to guard the point-of-attack much, you know, mainly with, with everything that he has to do on offense and the injury load. Terrence Mann is... And Terrence Mann is an energizer bunny. You know, he rebounds. He cuts. And there was one time against the Suns where the Clipper players are just so stagnant. When teams switch everything, it just exposes the lack of off-ball movement in some of the Clipper players. And you know what's funny? Two of the three players I mentioned with spontaneous off-ball movement, Terrence Mann and Luke Kennard, were two players that cut to the basket when Suns defenders were just ball-watching and scored on Sunday night. So again, taking notes. Got to cut. Can't just stand around at the three-point line, everybody, and make some, watch somebody go one-on-one. It's just not good basketball. And Terrence Mann is, is a good cutter. So, again, I think he needs to play more. But it's like, it's such a tough job for Ty Lue. Because you got John Wall, who played, who was one of the only players who played well, in my opinion, against the Suns. And even in the game where you don't have Kawhi Leonard and Paul George, and the Clippers do play 10 deep. Amir Coffey played five minutes. He was like the, you know, the 10th man. And Terrence played 15 and was two for three and had five points and had some really solid defensive moments in the fourth quarter against the Aaron Fox, Davion Mitchell, these guys. But yeah, it's a tough decision to make. And maybe he should start. I don't even know. The Clippers may need to make a change. I just don't know how I feel about the Reggie and Norman thing coming uh, starting. But the thing is, if you put Norman on the bench and put in a Nico or a Terrence, you're kind of small on the bench with Wall, Norman Powell, and Kennard. So, and then, of course, not even a backup center. So, dilemma, dilemma, decisions, decisions. It's going to all come down to what Ty thinks. I don't think he had a good game coaching against the Suns. But it's Ty Lu. Everybody makes mistakes, and that's one thing people need to understand. Coaches make mistakes, too. They're humans. And Ty Lu said it very clearly. He says we're not as good as the Suns right now. And that's true. They've played together for three years now with minimal injuries and know each other very well. And the Clippers, it's going to take time, but it's also you can't judge them until Kawhi Leonard and John Wall are off this restriction thing. And it doesn't matter whether they're still on the restriction or not against the Thunder. The Clippers should go into Oklahoma City and get two wins. No excuses. None. And plus, it's not even a back-to-back. The Clippers are playing against the Thunder with a day rest. So it should be a W for the Clippers. That tips off 5 o'clock local time. When I say local, I mean Los Angeles time. 7 o'clock. Oklahoma City time. The game's in Oklahoma City, and the Thunder are 0-3. Even though they've competed in some of those games, they are 0-3. The Clippers should absolutely get a win in OKC, and I think they will. And you know, the great thing about basketball as opposed to other sports is it's the shortest turnaround for the next game. You don't have to wait till next week, like football or soccer. You're right back on the horse, and the Clippers don't have a back-to-back. They play on the 25th on Tuesday and the 27th on Thursday, both games at Oklahoma City. Both games tip off at 5 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Central Time. And, of course, I'm going to be having an episode every single day of this week, five days a week. You already know how it goes. Make sure to comment on the pin question today, and that is, should the Clippers make a starting lineup change even before Kawhi Leonard is put back into the starting lineup? Let me know. Remember, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at DimeDropperPod. And by the way, for those of you who are sending me reviews on Apple Podcasts that are saying nice things, I really appreciate it. Keep doing it. If you really enjoy what I'm doing and you think I'm doing a good job, please tell people so more people can listen. And if you don't think I'm doing a good job, comment about what I what you think I can improve on. I know some of you guys are talking about posting clips and all this and graphics. A lot of that has to get improved by the network. And, you know, I don't have, have as much time as you think doing this. But also... Yeah, follow me on Twitter and Instagram at DimeDropperPod. And shout out to the guy who came up to me at the game last night after the game and said I enjoy your podcast. Uh, I should have asked for your name, brother. I was eating a hot dog. But uh, I really appreciate that. Um, it made me it, – it, it was a one positive thing out of the terrible night that I had. And by the way, the Axis app, oh, man, they really screwed me over. and missed. I missed the intros, and I was really pissed. But anyway, that's it for me today, guys. You already know how it is. The age-old proverb, go Clippers, we'll bounce back on Tuesday.